well, uh, I'm, um, excuse me, uh, Dan Caprio with uh, the Providence Group. Thank you for coming to our uh, discussion about the, uh, the global considerations for an ethical uh, Internet of Things. Uh, I've been involved with uh, ITF uh, for the last five or six years, and the topic of the Internet of Things is 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 not a new topic. We've been this has been an agenda item, the Dynamic Coalition, um, for the last the last five or six years. But <clears throat> the new emphasis on the ethic, I mean, what is considered uh, the ethical Internet of Things, is a new topic, and so we're 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 delighted and, and honored to really kick off that uh, uh, this discussion. Uh, here today at uh, at IGF USA, so we've got and and really want to kind of keep this informal and and uh, and have a conversation among the uh, the panelists and have a conversation among you. Obviously, I mean, recalling that as I as I indicated, this is a this is a new topic, but something um, that that is really worthwhile. And hope we can you know spend some time thinking uh, thinking and and and, and uh, working hard on it. So, the, as I said, the meeting in Brazil um, will consider the IoT going ethical and what that means uh, as we expect that regulation will be unable uh, to keep up with the pace of technological change in order to remain relevant in the long run, uh, industry, civil society, and government, all represented on this panel, uh, will, need, will need to think proactively about building security and privacy into new IoT products. <coughs> and so, obviously, there's a, a whole range of of, of global uh, issues that need to uh, need to be uh, uh, considered. So, uh, with me today on the panel um, have uh, Nula O'Connor, who's the uh, uh, chairman mm -hmm. and, and CEO of the Center for Democracy and, and uh, Technology, um, and Sokwu uh, uh, Ri from uh, NIST, and, and he's responsible for all of the good work that, that NIST is doing on smart cities and, and lots of other things, cyber physical systems, so some really cool stuff. Uh, Jeff Green with, with Symantec, who's here to uh, talk, you know, give us the security angle, and then uh, Peter Erickson with uh, MoDev, um, you know, very dynamic and active on the, uh, on the applications side. So <laughs> I thought I'd try to frame this a little bit. Um, because this is such a big, um, the big topic, <coughs> or, or it's such a big topic, and what does this mean since it's a new topic? Um, and explicitly, um, you know, embracing an ethical IoT, I mean, it could bring about a number of advantages. So one that I, you know, and I certainly want to put more on the table, but one uh, it reduces, it could reduce business risk uh, for investment in products and services from a legal perspective. Um, it could support uh, businesses in terms of a long-term relationship with consumers. Um, it could help society, um, you know, feel that they, you know, there's a high level of, 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 of trust. So I really start uh, with the following um, uh, stipulations or <coughs> assumptions. One, that is uh, IoT is a, is a global thing, um, and that's very important in, in the IGF context. So that means, obviously, it'll be used in different parts of the world uh, with different legislation, different cultures, values, and habits. Um, and as I said earlier, um, you know, legislation will be unable to, to keep up and uh, provide a framework uh, that we can, we can rely on for uh, protecting society. Second assumption is that IoT is something uh, we need in order to deal with a number of societal challenges. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this is really what's been referred to as the industrial internet. So agriculture, power, security, environmental uh, sustainability, the things that, that the, the technology and as it provides efficiency gains does some really remarkable things, um, you know, in, 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 in ways that really affect uh, society. Three, um, the assumption that the IoT is currently unmanageable and what little management uh, there is is neither secure nor private, or protecting privacy. And both of those, obviously, are important elements uh, for ensuring uh, justified trust in our connected environment. Four, uh, IoT needs investments in innovation and uh, deployment. And then five, as we, as we begin this discussion, I think we really need to focus on the uses of data 
and how the data is uh, secured and be careful that we're technology neutral in our discussion and that we don't demonize uh, systems and, and uh, networks. So with, with that, um, you know, really hoping that we can, we can have a, a broad discussion around privacy and data protection, around security, the importance of security, safety, and reliability, smart cities, and, and applications. But I've asked, I've asked uh, Nula um, to, uh, to kick this off because Nula you know, has a, a long experience in privacy and security and sort of thinks about this day in and, and day out and uh, you know, a long track record um, of accomplishment. And so Nula, let me, let me turn to you, uh, you know, to, to get started. What, I mean, what is this, what does it, you know, what could an ethical approach uh, in, in, in privacy and security or uses of data, what could that look like in, in practice? Well, thanks so much, Dan. Thanks to everyone for being here. Um, I have the joy of leading the Center for Democracy and Technology, which puts me in a very different vantage point than my previous several jobs. So, and part of our our job in advocacy and civil society is to you know question and challenge assumptions. So the first one I'm going to start with is the title. I hate the words the Internet of Things. It's not the Internet of Things, people. It's the Internet of People. We need a new acronym, Dan, and I've had this conversation over and over again. Um, these are you know internet-enabled devices and things and toys and you know parts of our houses and our dashboards of our cars and our nuclear power plants. These are meant to serve people. We, you know, there, there's a vision in, in advocacy and civil society of the dystopian future that looks more like, you know, open the pod bay doors, Hal, right? And um, and that's definitely Mark Rotenberg's. I don't mean to speak for Mark, but we've had this debate, ironically, on Facebook about some of the new devices, some of which I worked on when I was at Amazon. Um, and he said, one day that thing's not going to do what you want it to do, Nula, right? Uh, and I am in love with, and I'll, I could go on and on. I won't take up the entire hour and a half telling you about the Amazon Echo, but... Um, I am absolutely in love with my latest Internet of Things device, which is the Amazon Echo. Uh, I get no benefit financially for promoting this device, but I did work on it, and I'm incredibly proud of the privacy and security that we built into that product. Um, but this, th my view of the future is much more uh, not just the benign uh, robotics or Internet of Things shown in the Jetsons, but even more the uh, integrated, diverse, collaborative, forward-looking society enabled by technology in Star Trek. Do we have any Trekkies here? I am secretly very much a Trekkie. Thank you very much. But that is the vision, that the, that the technology will work for us. And so when I was at just I just got off the plane from Seattle late last night, and I was with my, my old team at, at Amazon. What a joy to be with them again. And um, I said, you know, how do I message Echo? Because we, knew, we, need, we need a short uh, elevator pitch, and it can't be what I say privately because it's, it's not good, and it uses other brand names. Um, and they said, it is the Star Trek. It is the first-gen Star Trek computer for your home. And that's really what it is, right? It is your home monitoring system. It's your music system. It's your turning off your lights. It's, I mean, my kids, I commend you all to the website to go watch the two-minute video. But it is the first gen of the truly connected home. Um, and so I, I love to tell this story because just it's a, it's a vignette that kind of, to me, signifies how we can get this right. Uh, when the, the R&D team called up and said, so we've got this thing and it looks like a Pringles can. It's going to sit on your kitchen counter. It's the summer of Snowden when we're working on this. And I said, yeah, that's really what I want is the NSA listening post on my, you know, that I plug in and pay for on my kitchen counter, uh, which is clearly why I'm better fit in this job than I was in my last one. But, um, and they said, I said, guys, you got to tell people this is listening. You know, you've got, you've got to tell people and you've got to provide a real hard on off switch, not just the software, but the hardware as well. And you know what? This is a great story about privacy by design, not that I want to give Ann Kavukian credit here, you know, but but it's about building it in from the, first of all, the, the earliest process in the, the software development life cycle, the product development life cycle, um, but also building in, you know, I heard some quibble about the ethical IoT as, as a construct. This is simply building in human rights values, not just privacy and security, but dignity into the world we're living in. And these kind of values need to be built in from the get-go. And I, am, I also don't think all hope is lost. I would echo our great Jeff Bezos, who says we are still on day one of the internet. So there is still time. I, I hear this despairing view that 
all your data is already out there and this has already gone too far. No, we are still at the earliest, earliest days. But the decisions we make today about the framework, the rubric, the, the, the way we relate to the individuals who we are hopefully are trying to serve, society and larger, not only individuals in their homes, but the larger, greater social good, ne those decisions need to be made today. And so again, a, a much more lighthearted vignette about, about Echo is once the design teams you know, heard me say, you gotta tell people they're listening. We gotta limit the amount of data we're collecting. We gotta really think about how we're using it in the back Background, you know, is it improving the, the, the product? Is it improving the individual's life? Or is it improving the world? And how are we disclosing that to them? They took it as a joyful exercise in product development and said, well, we can do that. We can make it light up. We can make it talk to you. We can make it disclose what we're doing. We can talk about how it's, you know, the data stored in the cloud. We can limit the amount of data. And so I'm very proud of my contribution to the Internet of Things is that the echo lights up and the lights go circle to the right and they turn blue when it's on. And, it, you know, but even more importantly, there is a hard on off switch. And that to me is very important that you get to control. So I guess those are the lessons I would leave. It's about dignity. It's about respect for the human. It's remembering that the devices are supposed to serve us, not the other way around, and um, and that these values can be built in and built in in a way that is fluid and facile and part of the transaction and the, the relationship between the self and the device. But those decisions have to be made intelligently. And there's got to be, again, a tone from the top and an, and an important value structure that rewards that kind of behavior. And that matters. And one last thought I'll leave you with, and I'm We'll leave some time for the rest of the panel. Um, and that is that it's not as clear cut. When I talk to industrial internet companies and then I talk to consumer internet companies, there is not as clear cut a line that one side is all industrial and one side is all consumer, meaning there's lots of data that's not necessarily relevant or personally identifiable or, you know, sensitive. And so there should be hierarchies of awareness of the kinds of data collected. And in the industrial world, you still can tell a lot about your employees and what they're doing, even if what you're monitoring is the device itself. And so the, the those who think that they're outside of these dialogues are actually usually missing the point. So with that. Thank you. Thanks for a, a good start. Um, let me, actually, I don't think I need to pass the microphone, but let me uh, turn it over to uh, to uh, Sokwu and, and kind of ask the same question, I mean, in, in terms of your role in, in government and the work that you're doing at NIST, you know, so much of it is about smart cities, and obviously, you know, the smarter the city, the better, um, I mean, because you know, I mean, services are being provided, trash is being picked up, there's just some fascinating things going on all around the, the world, and it's something that people can, can get in and are getting their head around. So, you know, how do you, I mean, in terms of, of government and the work that you're doing related to cyber physical systems, how can that relate to this, this bigger topic of, of an ethical uh, internet of things? Sure. So, um, first thing I want to point out is that um, smart cities, frankly, is, uh, is just a a uh, practical example of IoT. And the reason we, as a government, promote smart, uh, talk about smart city a lot is because that's very tangible, that's, that affects people's lives, and it's very easy to understand. Uh, first, IoT is not new, by the way. Uh, companies and industries and uh, the academic institutions have been doing it for decades. And if you remember a long time ago when Siemens and uh, GE, those guys had this first built up automatic control, building control system, connected through wired buses. Uh, that was not wireless, by the way, but that was connecting devices, connecting things. So, and then they even connected to internet. So that was already uh, internal things. Then why we're talking about IoT these days so often, uh, because, because now is people start think that now, oh, with these things you can do a lot more than just turning on and off your air conditioning system, okay? And because of that, now suddenly people start thinking you can use it for this application and that application, this industry and that industry. So it's becoming almost like a term that describes everything connected to everything, uh, which, which is good, but because it is, it's been very old, but at the same time, uh, it's, it's exploding right now suddenly, there are a lot of misunderstandings out there. Um, and then there's a lot of misconceptions out there. So um, the first thing, now, you know, internal IoT is not new, but at the same time, now a lot, for a lot of people, that's new. Uh, one thing that we have to understand here is 
it exists for a long time. So it's not like you need to freak out today because you say, oh, there's suddenly a, a great monster came out from out of the sky and you got to deal with something. The monster has existed for a long time. It's not like they came out of a blue. Uh, that's first thing. So uh, we should look at it very logically and we have to look at it very uh, uh, with, with a really uh, real care, but at the same time, we have to look at it uh, without too much of the fear built in into the perspectives. So, um, and that's, that's the first thing, uh, really, IoT is not new. And second thing is, it's very vague. It's a concept, it's an enabler. So there's no industry called IoT industry, per se, okay? IoT is trying to make existing industries and probably some new industries better and more efficient. It's like, a, think about it, it's like when PCs and internet first came about. It's not like, it, yeah, it created a new industry for semiconductors and things like that, but it's not like it created, for example, new spreadsheet. It did not create a new way to do financing. It just made the process easier and more efficient by having Excel spreadsheet or Lotus 1, 2, 3, whatever you want to call it. So this is an enabler. The question is, how do you use this new concept and new technologies to really uh, make, it, make the businesses benefit from that? That's really the question. It's, it's not about, okay, you're gonna sell more chips. It's not about, oh, you're gonna have trillion devices connected. Connectivity does not produce real impact. The businesses and actual benefits that's created, the mo business model created on top of the connected world creates a real benefit, it creates a real impact, okay? Um, talking about smart city, so why smart city? Uh, think about anything that you see in a city, uh, except consumer devices probably, energy, transportation, healthcare, uh, you know, disaster response. Virtually anything you see in a city could be or will and will be affected by IoT. Okay, so it's a huge wave. It's very important to understand what the core is, and at the same time, we should not be afraid to take this challenge. And there are a lot of issues with child, uh, security and privacy we have to tackle, obviously, but trends moving, basically. And you wanna, you wanna think about how we can be more efficient in the train instead of trying to stop the train. That's kind of, uh, you know, my two cents. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Taku. Um, Jeff, t turning to, to you and sort of thinking about um, security, uh, and, and the importance of, of security. I mean, obviously, you know, privacy and security are inseparable. You can't have privacy without security. Um, I mean, how do how do you think about um, about this this topic? I mean, what could what could you know, in terms of a, a, a voluntary you know set of things that are practical that business could do? What could it, what are what are some considerations that we need to discuss about what an ethical um, IOT could mean in practice in the, in the security field. Yeah, um, thanks, Ben. And I, I want to agree completely with what Noel said about we need to come up with something better than Internet of Things IOT. I don't, I don't have an, op, uh, an option, but I, it's become pretty trite at this point, and I worry sometimes people's eyes start glazing over. Um, but it, when we think about security, I wanna, about 18 months ago, I went to fairly um, a conference that was focused on IOT connected devices. It was it was not polished, and I thought that was great. You know, the show floor had everything from um, major industrial manufacturers to literally people had things with cardboard and duct tape and wires coming out of them. And I walked around talking to the folks, and I, and I came away with, uh, and, and there was literally only one vendor I talked to who had really, except for the you know the GEs of the world who had thought about security, the startup types who thought about it, and that was a security startup. Uh, and that was a little eye-opening to me. But the other thought I had was, so I came in as one guy, and he had this really cool device that was about a little bigger than like the cube you get for your Apple iPhone. Um, well, you plug it into the wall, and then you plug other stuff into it, and you can then remotely turn those devices on and off. Um, and I said, well, how much does it cost? He said, well, it's about you know, it's $20 each, but it's 15 if you buy a bunch. And I said, so I have 15 things plugged into my house I now need. 15 of these and, and he said yeah but you can monitor power consumption and, and turn them on and off and I said so it sounds like it's it's the clapper but through my iPhone <laughs> the clapper and he didn't know what I was talking about he's a lot younger than me um, 
But the thing that, that, that I came away with from him and other, other folks is that a question that I think we're missing with a lot of things being connected, the focus has been can we connect it, not should we connect it. And I think that leads into, into, into the security issue because there are a lot of things we can connect. Um, and whether that is on the um, company level, do you need to build this, but on an individual level, do I really need to have X connected or am I doing okay with it unconnected? Because when you connect it, you bring with it risk. And, and another side, one of the things I really liked about the way Dan set up this panel is that we're not talking about the sky is falling, Skynet we were joking up, or this is not the end of the world. We, we do gonna introduce new risks, but it's not gonna be, um, it is a flavor of what we've been dealing with for, for 20 years. Um, Saku's right, I agree completely, this is not new. I was on another panel, we were talking about is IoT evolutionary or revolutionary or, or a fad, and the general conclusion was, was evolutionary. And because of that, you know, there's some basic rules to, to security when you think about IoT devices. And the first I got from the same conference, a big slide, a guy put up, rule number one is don't be dumb. Don't you know, be dumb. Don't be dumb. You know, you think about this smart. And rule number two was the basics haven't changed. Um, the things you do to secure uh, a networked computer shouldn't be that much different with a network device. There are new permutations of it, but don't forget the basics. Um, don't fall in love with your product and start thinking about it as it has a person. Even though the Echo is great, although <laughs> my kids, Andy, I need to five. figure out what I'm doing <laughs> wrong with my Echo, so I'll love it more. Um, but you need to have a policy and a plan. You need to think about security, and that needs to be uh, twofold. One, the individual, if you, if you buy a device, or two, at the corporate level. And here I'm conflating, I'm mostly focusing on commercial. There's a, we could talk for a long time about, you know, you can put IoT in a lot of different buckets, the industrial, the commercial, and there are a lot of different security aspects and a lot of different issues there. Um, but security needs to be something, and this is, you know, the old cliche, bake it in rather than bolt it on. But the reality is we're going to be dealing with a bolted on world because um, a lot of the devices out there, they're going to be network enabled Happy Meals from McDonald's soon. How are we going to secure them before we hook them up to our home Wi-Fi network? Um, but two last points I would leave to is that um, if you're thinking about security, the fact that there is a device in the end that moves, interacts, senses in the physical world is a fundamental difference, and that needs to be a component of your security plan. It might not change what you do, but don't forget that. Don't think it's just ones and zeros. And the last thing is don't rely on obscurity. Um, if security by obscurity ever worked, it is not going to work now um, with everything from Shodan to other search engines crawling the internet looking for devices to the fact that you can find just about anything connected. You cannot assume uh, you're going to be secure just because you think you're hiding in some little corner of the connected world. So. Thanks, Jeff. So, so uh, Peter, we 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 come to you kind of with the with the same question. In 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 your world, I know you you think about this a lot. You speak about this a lot. You talk to a lot of different. Um, I mean, people. How would you propose that we? we begin to, to think about or, or, or frame an ethical uh, Internet of Things? Yeah, I think that, um, and again, yeah, so I come at this from a developer standpoint. So, you know, Modev, we've been, um, we've been convening developers around uh, mobile and related technology since 2008. Um, and, uh, and through that, I get involved in, in, in quite a number of different companies, large and small. I work with Amazon on Echo currently. Uh, organizing their um, their developer events, um, uh, also worked with uh, recently with Samsung and Google, and uh, have some other inter interesting projects um, that we're going to be announcing soon. All based on developers, and I think that if you look at what happened in the application space, um, you know, circa 2009, we went through this period of like hyper innovation. It's just amazing to see how many business models changed dramatically uh, in the span between 2009 and let's say 2013. Um, if you look at you know Uber and Airbnb and and uh, Waze and you know so many others, it's just it's just phenomenal. Uh, and really, those 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 evolutions in 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 society, really, were you know started by developers coming up with you know better ways to connect people and, and things. Quite frankly, so the Internet of Things is 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 actually we're at a point where that hyper innovation is now going to go outside of the app and start to reach the things. I mean, Fitbit's another great example of that. I mean, here we have a public company that wasn't even around three years ago, you know, and and uh, and why are they why are they changing the market? Well, it comes 
back down to data and individuals. So I think ethical innovation to me, um, when I you know when I work with developers and talk to developers about what they're doing and try to help them overcome roadblocks, um, you know everything from you know from from regulation to uh, to funding, et cetera, et cetera, because there are many out there. But um, it really you have to you have to rely on the uh, you have to rely on the individual, and that means the you know the individual developer, the individual consumer, um, and the industry, um, the individual organizations that make up the industry. If you look at the Motion Picture Association, I mean they've done a very good job of like managing uh, you know motion pictures, and I think that you know ethical innovation in this space and IoT kind of has to look back to industry to help solve these problems so that we can not impede innovation, not impede the individual developers to help us lead to even more, you know, amazing, uh, amazing new companies, applications, more frictionless society, better ways to do things. As, you know, more and more SDKs become available from, you know, IBM with their Watson platform or Amazon's uh, Alexa SDK, um, which they just announced last week, so that the, SD, the uh, platform that runs the Echo, which is called Alexa, is now decoupled from the Echo, and developers can access that and start to build applications on top of that. So now, so that you know, the ethical considerations that Amazon had to go through in order to get that product to market um, are you know now at the hands of a lot of different developers. So they went out, they, they did it successfully with Echo, and I'm also a customer, and it's really really fun device to have in the house um, and interact with. And I love asking her to open the pod bay doors. It's still one of my favorite things to ask her. She, um, she says, she says, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I can't do that, Dave. I'm not Hal, and we're not in space. So, kind of like, you know. Nice. Program, just Natalie say, my name is not Hal. My name is not Hal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, um, but I mean, it just, you know, it, the, the whole discussion really comes back to, you know, we have to be able to, we have to be able to police ourselves in, in many ways. And, and uh you know, that's why, that's why, you know, things like ratings exist and they do a really good job of like saying, calling out who the good and bad people are. I mean, when you take a ride on, on Uber or Lyft, you know, you get rated as a writer. You rate your driver. Everybody, that's kind of like where we're going as a society. So we can figure that out. Um, you know, the, and very famous things happening on Reddit recently. Uh, you know, I think that, that we have the ability to, to take care of ourselves. It's why, I mean, everybody, how many people have received a free credit report notice in the last 60 days, right? I mean, it's amazing, right? I get a new one. It seems like every week I'm kind of over it, you know? It's like, okay, great. Um, and what they're saying is we got to, like, start watching out for ourselves. And that's, that, I'd say that's a, that's a big difference in society, and it's kind of scary, but I think that at some point we have to go that route and let developers develop, let them innovate, you know, Let's not stop them. Um, recently was involved in two different projects that are interesting uh, in the healthcare IoT space. One, a new device to um, improve um, diabetic monitoring uh, with iOS and Android apps and you know, really, really innovative technology, high dollar project. Um, went the route of FDA approval um, because they had to, because they had a, a small medical device, but they also went through the FDA approval process on the application, which is pretty interesting. Um, and then another uh, in the blood alcohol breathalyzer space um, that went zero regulation through Kickstarter, and they launched a Kickstarter on Sunday. They've already they've already beat their goal of thirty five thousand dollars to raise, and they've got twenty seven days left. They're probably going to definitely get into the six figures. And um, what's interesting when I kind of look at these two projects juxtaposed together, so one received SBA approval less than thirty days ago. The other one on Kickstarter. Um, really, really fascinating to kind of see that and to see the guys, the um, the hunger for people out there for IoT type devices and the blood, the, the back device, the blood alcohol device um, called Drinkmate. So you can go look it up. Uh, what's interesting about it is uh, you don't put your mouth on it, so you, you don't have to. You know, more than one person can use it, and it's about friends sharing the data of their blood alcohol scores with each other actually encourage everybody to act and behave more responsibly. So if someone's got the data, we blow up uh, an illegal limit, we're in college, and our friends get that information, we can actually make sure that that friend's not going to drive. So pretty interesting use of data, of IoT, um, to actually improve society. Uh, 
um, I, I just kind of share those anecdotes because I think they're kind of interesting and, and uh, you know, very innovative on the, um, on the individual developer side. But, but you know, Sean at Drinkmate um, could not make this innovation possible and actually work to, you know, improve lives and maybe save lives eventually uh, with this product um, if he was encumbered at all because he has zero money to go get even a $3,500 FDA registration. Um, that's just not possible. Um, and the second we start to do anything that even is small to, you know, to do that, we, we get in the way. So leave ethics in the hands of, 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 of society. And I think we do a pretty good job of, of organizing and finding out ways to, uh, to protect ourselves. Uh, so so uh, thank you, Peter. Um, I, I know I want to give others a, a chance to respond. So, so thank you for sort of beginning to address, at least what I heard, sort of the, the notion of ethical uh, innovation. And you, you talked about relying upon the individual and relying upon industry. So just to sort of continue to set the table, as you, as you think about ethical innovation, what do you see as the role, I mean, or do you see a role for government? And what's the role, what's the role of the, the community uh, or uh, civil society Going forward, then I'll ask I'll ask uh, Nula uh, to uh, to respond. Well, my thought initially on that is that you know government plays a great role in um, in enforcement um, and prosecution for people that you know break laws um, that use uh, data nefariously for nefarious purposes. Um, so you know it's one thing to be a hacker; it's another thing to be a hacker that uses the data nefariously. Um, so you've got white hat hackers and you've got black hat hackers. You know, white hat hackers are just as important to society, are more important to society um, than we recognize. I think a lot of us, they get thrown out there. But, um, you know, so I think government does a, does, you know, does a fair job. The DOJ does a good job of enforcement and of going after the bad guys. And I think that that's what government should continue to do. The second we start to try to decide in advance What's right and wrong relative to innovation? We get into a lot of trouble, and we could, uh, you know, we could stifle innovation. Thanks. Just in um, case you didn't know why. No, thank you. As you can see, this is a volunteer effort, so um, thank you for bearing with us. Um, so, Nula, um, what do you think? So I hope it was clear from my enthusiasm about Echo and and my time in the tech sector from the '90s to just a couple of years ago that. I personally love technology. I believe technology can solve the great societal challenges we have in healthcare, in education, in the environment, in things as, as not trivial, trivial at all, but important as transportation, like my favorite other app, Waze. Um, and there is much good to be done. And I, I, I've used this example all the time. I'm a busy, single, working mother of three young children. I could not do the things I need to do in a day without this and without every device in my... And as you see, I'm wearing my Fitbit. I was one of the earliest adopters. And I'm proud to say CDT is partnering with Fitbit on a research project founded by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to study their data flows and their use of data and, their, and the device and how it relates to the human... Um, so I have a very, hopefully, a very positive, you know, vision of the world going forward. Um, and I'm also, I think, as I've just been tested, we did an online test the other day. I'm a hardcore libertarian, so I'm a big believer that the individual can get it right. And yet, there are a number of compelling examples that we have studied at CDT and elsewhere that show we do need a few nudges in the right direction as a tech, as an industry, as a society. Um, Take me off the panel, as apparently the IGF wants to, and you've got an all-male panel again in technology, right? And so, I mean, we've seen that 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 phrase over and over again. I don't want to go to the other extreme and have non, you know, I want to have diversity in, in all its many forms, including diversity of opinion and viewpoint. Um, I'm equally suspect about the federal government, having served in the federal government for five years, uh, that it can move as fast as technology and innovation needs to. Um, but let's go further on the example of the... Um, a drug blood alcohol content. Um, I was. We were just talking to a technology company the other day that has developed technology around seeing how much blood alcohol is in your body before you get into a car, or rather, before you strap your seatbelt on and turn the car keys. Now, this is something very personally important to me. I have some uh, 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 personal experience, you know, history, and and, um, and 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 my life has been touched by alcoholism in in, in ways. Uh, 
I would love to see a society where we do not have uh, an endemic problem, but this technology would basically, through your fingertips, know when you pull your seatbelt on, which of course, hopefully, you're putting your seatbelt on. If you're that drunk, I'm not sure you'd actually put your seatbelt on. But anyway, the, the premise was you couldn't test the air in a car because that could get the, the passenger. You, so you had to do something that was just going to get the driver. If you pull the seatbelt on through your fingertips, you would be able to test for how much blood alcohol is in the, the body and not turn on the car. It's not dissimilar to the kinds of drug monitoring and alcohol monitoring you see in, in kind of post-conviction uh, experiences for alcoholics and that sort of thing. What happens when the government says every car has to have that? Right? I mean, again, again, a hardcore libertarian, I would say, I'm not sure how far we want to go with government intervention using the technologies to control behavior. And it's a hard, that's, again, a very personally hard question for me. But I'm concerned about government actually use of the technology to intervene in our daily lives. So one, you know, again, I, I'm not entirely joking when I say, thinking about uh, Alexa and, and uh, the Echo in the summer of Snowden, I thought, Wow, you know, that's a lot of granular information about what we would say, in, you know, in law school was inside the curtilage of your home, right? The more granular, the more inside the home, the more kind of behavioral science we can glean about people and how much of that ends up in the hands of the federal government. So th that's our crucible at CDC right now, obviously, is, is segregating private sector data from government data and making sure those two data sets stay separate. Um, but even in the, the design phase, I mean, the more frivolous example I would use is Oculus, right? So when Oculus was developed by an all-male team, and they, they finally went to market, and it made women nauseous. Like, you couldn't actually use it. And it was something about how your eyes focus and the width of the eyes, the viewer and whatever, whatever. Not having diverse design teams does not lead to the best market rollout, right? Whether it's age, gender, whatever, physiology. So device human being relationships need to be tested on diverse bodies and diverse, you know, people, and having a diverse design team and diverse industry actually is better for the rollout, right? It's simply a, a, a two-market cost that um, needs to be borne. But even more, are we building those values in, you know, psychologically? Are we looking at those kind of, I love the phrase, yes, you can connect it, but should you? That was the role I played at GE, at Amazon, at any number of companies. You know, yes, absolutely, we can do that. We can collect that data. Now, is that a good idea? Do we want to? And thinking about it and rephrasing it in terms of, I think I've scared our panelists away, apparently. So um, thinking about it in terms of what's best for the company also. Having less data means there's less of a risk of breach, right? If you don't have, as we've seen in the federal government, breach 25 years of the most sensitive data of people's lives, the breach would have had been less catastrophic. It still would have been catastrophic, but it would have been less, fewer people affected, less uh, length of time, that sort of thing. Um, and so, you know, I would, uh, I would say we do need some nudges, and it, whether it's in the curriculum in, in computer science and engineering schools, whether it's building these structures into corporations and, and small companies and startups. Our biggest challenge at CDT is working not only with big brand names who really do, I think, and largely are trying to get this right by hiring data ethicists, by hiring sociologists and psychologists and anthropologists to think about the effect that these devices are having on the world and creating the society with the values that we want to, to espouse. But it's well pointed out, a small startup with one or two people doesn't have the, t the, the time or the resources and the money for a full-time chief privacy officer or a full-time data ethicist. So we need to think of other ways to influence the development process so that these values are embedded. Because the reality is, once the, 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 the code is programmed, it's opaque, right? Once the device is programmed and it's running in the background in the walls of your home, in the dashboard of your car, you really can't, you know, you won't have as much access to the information about how the decision is being made. And so the last example I would leave to you, even in a more opaque, in a more sort of visible way, we recently saw a study where job searches online, say a hypothetical job search, people going to a, a, a search, and it wasn't LinkedIn, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't a brand name that, that I've uh, worked with. It was, um, you know, simply a job search site trying to target appropriate level jobs to people tr surfing to their site from other sites and say the hypothetical search was CIO jobs in Seattle. Those jobs were shown to at a rate of 88% men to 12% women surfing to the site based entirely only on cookie behavior and surfing behavior, not identifiable, not name, not anything. Same region of the country, same job. C-suite jobs were shown to men at a rate of 88% and 12% women. So yes, 
when we know that there's, a, you know, when we're able to, to glean from what the algorithm is doing or we're able to see or there's disclosure, this is why we need disclosure, right? I mean, this, it's, it's to, to talk about what's there. But even more, what, this is why we need to program the values and do the stress testing in the code to make sure that there's not unintended bias and, and opaque bias and kind of unintended disparate impact. Because I, I don't think that, clearly, that was not what the, the site intended to do. But the reality is based on assumptions about you surfed in, let's be really gendered here, from Sports Illustrated versus you surfed surfed in from Vogue, the women weren't even aware that they weren't getting the opportunity. And so what we're talking about is opportunity lost. It's one thing to apply for the job and not get it because you don't got the credentials, you don't got the experience, whatever, whatever, but to never be shown the opportunity. So that's what we're worried about CDT. Again, it's not, it's, it's, it's well-intentioned coding and, and that sort of thing that has an unintended disparate impact that's affecting people's opportunity. And I'm all in. Again, I'm, as, you, as I hope I've shown you, I'm all in for the completely connected home and car and school and, 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 and society. But we've got to really test our assumptions that the devices we're creating, the world we're creating, are promoting the best of democratic values and the best of equal opportunity for people of all backgrounds. And we've really got to question our assumptions that we're always getting this right. Jeff. Um, so I almost hesitate to talk about this because I'm going to sound like I'm some pro-regulation hawk, uh, and I'm not. Um, I agree with what Peter said, but I want to shift, and, and Newell, but I want to shift to a different domain where the notion, you know, when we're talking in the commercial and the individual personal IoT, for lack of a better word, uh, absolutely agree that the we can self-police to a large degree, not completely, but we can self-police to a large degree. The market will help sort it out, but that's not always going to be the case. And the example I'm putting back on my government hat, you know, the, I would always say, so I live in Montgomery County and I get my electricity from Pepco. I actually have no idea what, what how good Pepco is or is not in cybersecurity, but let's say I knew that Pepco had really crappy security. I don't have a choice. So there's nothing I as an individual, I guess I could try to start a market campaign or something, but realistically, I'm beholden to them. And I really don't have a, you know, what am I going to say, don't give me electricity? I mean, so, so there are scenarios where, you know, not necessarily through regulation, although certainly the, the electricity is a regulated area, where government needs to have an involvement. And as we get away from the personal and into the industrial, I think that is, is much more the case. But other examples in, in the... Um, in the more personal I would give, you know, a year ago when I was out talking about, I do a lot of work uh, talking about our annual internet security threat report, and we talked about the number of breaches we had in, in 2013, and it was enormous with Target and this, that, and the other. And I was out there roughly a year ago telling people, one year from now, I predict, I will be telling you that there was a significant drop in the volume of breaches for two reasons. One, the monetization, these credit card dumps are worth a lot less. But number two, industry retail are going to step up their game because they've seen the implication or what can happen. And unfortunately, that was not the case. So if the market has failed to some degree, if we have not seen a big uptick, and that's, the, you know, market failure in cybersecurity was a common refrain when I was in government, 2009, 2010, we're talking about it, and I don't think it has necessarily changed. And the last example I'd give on the very individual level is who in here has ever read the entire EULA of an app that they downloaded? <laughs> So we have one, and little, I've asked that question here about the second person about 10 times who's ever, who's ever said that. I haven't, and I'm, I'm a paranoid attorney. Um, but so to some degree, we are, we are giving away um, our choice. You know, could we simplify that? Yeah, and the same thing with even if we know we're giving it away, well, we want the free app, you know, so we're willing to give away the data. So it is an imperfect world of choice. I mean, I think we can help drive it, but the government has to play a hand, and I think enforcement FTC in particular has been pretty aggressive, as Peter said, is one area where if you're not living up to those commitments, even if no one reads them, you better be careful. So <clears throat> let's get back to this issue of ethical IoT, yeah. because this is actually a fantastic topic. Before we talk about it, let's look at the landscape of IoT and what's the issue and why we're even talking about these stuffs. There has been tons of investment for the last decades, two, three, four decades on IoT. Billions and billions of dollars have invested on it, technology side. And we still do not see the enough IOTs around. We still do not see 80% of people understand what those are. And this is an issue. So why is the case? The main reason, uh, I mean, there are a lot of different reasons, but one of the main reasons is a fragmentation, meaning everybody does their own thing. 
and then essentially it's all layer, all level of this uh, this IoT communication, hardware, software, and service. Virtually everybody has their own thing, and they are not interoperable. Okay, so here's a here's a fundamental question: Why is this is happening? I mean, we are trying to uh, drive this industry to be more efficient, productive, but why is not converging? If you look at it, uh, the investment uh, uh, done by corporations, a lot of them are invested in the product development, sales, and marketing, obviously, but how much of them are invested, especially in IoT perspective, in trying to create consensus among players and stakeholders? Not a lot. And even if you go to like uh, IEEE and you know ISO, all these kind of standards groups, the folks who sit in the group from corporation are not necessarily the folks who have a lot of voice in making the products work outside. Meaning, whatever they agree on piece of paper about standards, that's not necessarily going to be translated into the actual products that you guys are going to use out there. All right, this is a funny situation. So the reason I bring it up is is that. First, I think industry and academia and everybody, all stakeholders should pay more attention in creating consensus. Now, let's talk about ethical IoT a little bit. So to make ethical IoT work, it has to be voluntary, okay? So government will not gonna come up and say, you have to do it, be ethical. I mean, you, it's not gonna come up and say, oh, there's a law that everybody has to be ethical. It's more like the government, uh, it, it more like the industry and the stakeholders should get together and create consensus on their standards, not just in the technology perspective, but the privacy and security issues. And what can what could government do? Government can help, can help make that happen. We are not gonna dictate, or even NIST, I mean, a lot of, there are, there are a lot of mis misconception about NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is part of the Commerce Department. We do not regulate, we are not a regulation regulating body. We are R&D body to help the, the private sector to create their own consensus. And I think where that's where the ethical IoT can really shine because if the industry and stakeholders can agree on or even create some kind of consensus about what it should be, and like security policy issues, and we can help. So I always talk about um, uh, this. Traditionally, government has played two roles. In uh, or encouraging new technologies. First one is R&D funding, like National Science in, uh, Foundation has invested like hundreds of millions of dollars for the last few years in, in what we call cyber physical system. That's actually IoT. Cyber is internet, physical is, uh, is things. So CPS, cyber physical system is internal things. That's one way to do it. That's what we traditionally have been doing. Secondly, regulation. Uh, FDA, for example, we talked about it, or, or other regulatory bodies, just make sure that these are safe and is secure to the level, that is minimum level, that government really thinks is, is ha we have to protect the consumer. I believe there's a third role that government can play here, which means the government can provide a playground for these innovations and technologies to be tested and to flourish and frankly, to compete each other. To create a consensus, you have to essentially say, something has to be better than others, but government will not gonna say that. And we are not in position to pick winners and losers. We don't do that. But we can actually accelerate, can help accelerate the industry and stakeholders to figure out where and which point they will have to converge and create consensus around. And I think that's, that's kind of like what we try to do at NIST, especially through standards and through uh, framework uh, works and uh, the project I'm running on IoT, Smart Cities Challenge. They're all focused on that perspective, how we can help the industry to create consensus and create uh, American competitiveness. So that's my take. Thanks. Um, Looks, uh, we want to in, uh, encourage audience uh, participation. So, uh, you know, if you have a question, please come to the microphone and identify yourself and your your company. And you know, let's please. Thank you. My name is David McCarley, and I'm a fair son. And I'm going to basically make a comment, possibly a question, and reaction to a lot of what you said, but specifically to what you said. And I think the environment 
question and really a, a multi-faceted question because, you know, we're seeing, I mean, I mean, the role that the work that NIST is doing, the work the Federal Trade Commission is doing, but we're seeing, you know, lots of things happening in lots of different silos. I mean, Department of Transportation with smart cars, Department of Energy with smart grid, uh, HHS, you know, with, um, with health related uh, data. So it, it's a, it's a, it's that's a, um, it's a, it's a very complex uh, question and one that I, I think we need to think through. But uh, let me uh, just comments. Res respond to the question. Um, <clears throat> so when you say enforcement, uh, by nature you have to pick a winner, meaning that you have to basically, if you want to, if you want to enforce anything, you have to say this is something will be enforced. The question comes down to what is that? How do we pick the winner? How do we know, for example, a product from A company is better than B or technology from A company is better than B? That's not what governments are gonna choose. That's what industry, actually, that's what market has to choose. Okay, so for example, you said you created the identification scheme or uh, new technology. So how many devices out there are actually using it? Not really, well, I, I may be wrong. If it's really prevalent, like 70% of the IoT devices out there are already using it, then there's no reason to enforce it because it's already de facto standards. And that's, the, that's what we need to see, the industry actually to create consensus and converge, and the customers actually converge on it. But without actually showing that, without just showing what's the benefits <coughs> of those technologies, those convergence will never gonna happen. So what government should, what I meant by providing playground is given opportunities to the <coughs> industry and whoever is building these technologies to be able to show off why their stuffs are great, meaning that why their stuffs create real impact and benefits. And maybe there are some technologies that may not create that much of impact. Then, frankly, those technologies, we're gonna, the customers and the market, we're gonna basically weed them out. And the question is, how do we accelerate the process? How do we actually, and that's really what you, are, you have a very valid question, but at the same time, a lot of the role of the enforcement, I think, is related to market dynamics. Two things, I mean, the FTC is, they've been engaged in enforcement uh, when there are, are privacy concerns. The, the case that really comes to mind is with security cameras, TrendNet, where they were, they were insecure, and the FTC's uh, approach was this violated the assurances they made about the security of the camera, and they, and they went after them for things like uh, transmitting credentials in clear text, um, not having a secure login, essentially. But there's a fourth role that I think government can play, and that is a market maker, because the government spends so much money, um, and through the devices that the government chooses to buy, will both give a boost to a company to advertise, particularly internationally, but also in the US, but also provide funding through sales to allow. And that's a perfectly legitimate role the government has to play, because the government shouldn't be developing this stuff on its own. Um, but I, I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that government dollars um, will drive innovation and the government needs to be cognizant of how it's going to impact. Uh, and if the government drives secure innovation, um, that could uh, bleed out into the marketplace. I just did a quick Google search on uh, 
FTC, mobile app finds, pretty interesting. I mean, Yelp, Tiny Co, Google, Apple. Let's see here, more and more. Um, uh, there's just several. I mean, it's just, just, just amazing. Um, a lot of them around kids apps, uh, so COPPA. Yeah. And you know, COPPA, it's, it's a set of laws that, um, and rules, uh, regulations that people have to follow if they're making apps, actually any app, um, because kids can access apps these days, and it's, it's, you know, so there are a number of rules there. If those are not, they're watching that closely. Um, so, I mean, I think that that's, you know, if you look at that, and there's, there's tens of millions of dollars in fines here, you know, um, and there's some, there's, some, there's some smaller apps that just really kind of just put them out of business because they just didn't have the ability to pay, pay the fines. But, um, but, I mean, I think enforcement does, at the end of the day, it, you know, it works, and FTC is busy in this area. The question, I think, really is, does ex post versus ex ante enforcement work, right? So the European approach is we're going to spell out what the rules are and the guidelines, and you can act within and you can develop within where you know, those guidelines, whereas in the United States we wait for a, a behavioral fa failure or a market failure and then enforce after the fact. I'm not sure in the embedded internet that's going to be the long-term play, right? And and so there's a great there's been lots written about and the great work that the FTC has done in trying to encourage the right kinds of behavior and steer people. So if so, cool, if your point is that um, enforcing against big companies chooses the winners, then I think your point is very well taken. You know, that all those most of those brand names are are now winners in their field. Um, I think another question is: is a twenty million dollar fine against Google? kind of a drop in the bucket against Google, right? Um, so I, I think my, my curiosity is whether or not there is a role for, for ex ante statements, not only by the FTC, but, you know, through legislation in this country that sets us in the direction. And I think, you know, I have a visceral reaction to new law, right? I think there's a lot of good law on the books, and the Fair Credit Reporting Act is a great model for, you know, kind of disclosure and access and data. Um, and the FTC Act already exists and has clear standards for kind of behavior between companies and, and their individuals. Um, but the rest of the world thinks we're the great unwashed on this issue, right? I mean, really, you know, no federal omnibus privacy law is, is you know, it's been a challenging dialogue, Dan and Anna and others and I have been involved in for years. Um, so I think, I think, uh, I, I don't think that Regul uh, that enforcement actually chooses winners. I think it, enforcement largely chooses the losers. Um, I think enforcement has its role, especially for the outliers, like the flashlight app that, what was it taking all of your your address book data? Geolocation. Okay, really, I don't need to be geolocated in order to turn the darn flashlight on on my phone, right? I mean, that's a little over the top. I thought it was address book, though. That was a much better story. I've been telling that story for months. Um, so the outlying, you know, the outliers. So, so that you know, enforcement against the outliers absolutely sends a signal. I'd love to see even more, frankly, statements, you know, kind of positive statements ahead of the game from the commissioners to say, this is the kind of behavior we do want to see reinforced. We want to see equality. We want to see equal opportunity. We want to see democratic values embedded in the technology and the structure of the internet. Um, and, and as we all know, you're going to run for your money now from the FCC. So, you know, they, they will take a very different approach. And they are very, very active in saying we're going to tell you how to do it, uh, Internet people. So those are two very, right there in our own country, two very, very different models of regulation and enforcement that we will see. And I do not want to see, obviously, us, you know, uh, 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 cook the golden egg of the internet, right? I, I would like to see it free and 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 free to grow and innovate, um, but I do think we need some guardrails, kind of like I always an analogize to the the duck pin bowling my kids play, right? You know, just have those boundaries that say, don't go out there too far, or you know, that's going to be a problem for society. Yeah, I think the ethical thing comes back to you know, app. So the Apple, the you know, iOS is a great example of that because. The SDK allowed you to basically, if you're building any app, grab somebody's contact database um, without without their knowing. And so a lot of apps, um, you know, were doing that. Um, now, what Apple ended up doing was turning that capability off for developers so they couldn't just grab your contact information without explicitly asking you if they could access your contacts. Um, so Apple played a role. Um, right. In you know, in kind of helping to police this behavior, but you know, when they came out, it was sort of you know the wild, wild west, and uh, you know, so people took advantage of that, and that's going to continue to happen. Um, but you know, and you bring up Europe, uh, you know, I mean, it's the reason why a lot of the great innovations are coming out of the U.S. Um, is because people have the ability to monetize their apps using mobile advertising and everything else that, that's available to them to, to maximize the ability to monetize and. 
without that, you don't have the fuel to fuel the innovation. And, and so when you put the regulations in up front, people can't plug in meaningful applications that actually serve somebody an ad in their mobile app that's meaningful to them, that's, it's, you know, they're not gonna click it. Um, you know, all those, you know, that revenue goes down and the app doesn't really end up making it at the end of the day. But in the US, we have a lot more ability to, um, you know, to, uh, to serve somebody an ad that's relevant to them. Um, personalization is, is, you know, super strong in the US and I, you know, we put out, when we do events and we put advertisements out, um, you know, when you, if, if somebody has searched on something around, you know, mobile or events or something, we know that we can serve them an ad on one of our events. And, and so we get a higher, that kind of stuff is great for marketers. It's great for marketing. And I think that most consumers accept, you know, when, if you're looking for furniture and all of a sudden your Facebook page, well, there's the couch I just looked at three days ago. How did it appear in my Facebook feed? Well, you know, that's the magic behind the scenes. And that's, I think if we, if we crush that, we do a great disservice to innovation because that's what's, that's what's fueling. And, and, and Europe's a great example. Just, I'm so glad you brought up the issue of corporate responsibility in this ecosystem. And this, it's, it's a theme we're trying to draw out at CDT, which is corporate social responsibility in the digital age looks very different than corporate social responsibility did in the industrial age. I'm so proud of the fact that I got data and digital rights into GE's corporate social responsibility report uh, for the first time ever when I was there because the risks and the rewards involving individual data, consumer data, device data, Internet of Things data are different than the risks involving the use of natural resources and the planet and, and Earth and that sort of thing. But we can look at them in the same kind of compliance and responsibility responsibility framework. And as you point out, not that I want to put the responsibility and the liability on the platforms, far be it, but they can be leaders. They can be thought leaders in saying, and at Amazon in our app store, we asked all of our app developers to put the privacy policy right there on the sign-in screen so that when you downloaded the app, you knew what the deal was. You knew what the data deal was between you and the company. Um, and that that's good thought leadership, and that can be done, again, without any regulation, without any government inter intervention. But companies need to start thinking about privacy and security and data and device and relationship with the consumer in a very different way in the internet and able space. Just one quick comment. <clears throat> I completely agree with you that uh, you Corporations have to think differently. But let's first look at where we are in terms of industry in IoT. Okay? Because the reason this is important is because we are at the point. It's just small, small plant is just blossoming. This is even, it hasn't even blossomed yet. Okay? It just came out of the soil. Okay? How many IoT companies are you aware of that's making more than $100 million revenue as of today? Less than a handful. And if you look at from the whole industry perspective, that's that's very small number, okay? And what that means is the companies who are talking about IoT, and we all talk about IoT, but at the end of the day, if you ask how many of them are actually creating real profit out of that or revenue out of that, we are still very, very early stage. This is not a techno technology issue. This is a business model issue, okay? So we are just at the point that you put a seed in the soil and seed is just starting to come out. You don't know whether it's gonna be a rose, you don't know it's gonna be a tree, well, you don't know what is gonna be like that. So uh, we gotta be very careful when you're trying to put any kind of uh, uh, guidance around it. You put guidance, you are trying to put guidance without understanding what those things are, okay? And that it can easily kill it. And that's not what we really want to see. But at the same time, we want to make sure whatever that comes out of the soil can grow in an environment that is well, well maintained and it doesn't really go crazy. There's a delicate balance between this innovation and uh, you know this uh, regulation or the, uh, the all, all those kind of enforcements. But you, before we even talk about it, you have to first understand where we are in terms of the whole industry. And I think we are at the point that we have to at least first start to understand what's going to come out of the soil. Okay? And frankly, talking about any kind of enforcement regulation before you understand what... Does anybody can say here that I know exactly what's going to happen in 10 years in IoT arena? I can't say that. I, I worked in IoT for 30, 20 years now. Okay? And I still cannot see next five years. That's the nature of IoT as of today. So, just my two cents. So, will uh, will SCADA get fixed? 
They, you know, the old days of SG and Honeywell, those guys are trying to fix it for the last 25 years. I know. Yeah, so that's my comment. Everyone know it's gay days? It's the, uh, it's the protocol that uh, basically, um, the communication protocol that like maybe opens a dam or turns on and off, uh, you know, a uh, supply line to a nuclear facility. Um, and uh, it is the, it's the kind of the core protocol that is the kind of the first, I guess, kind of internet of things protocol, but it's highly insecure. Um, and it's very difficult to address SCADA uh, from a backwards compatibility standpoint with regards to today's uh, internet security standards. So it's a, it's a sticky wicket um, and uh, a lot of people are working on it, but you know, it's a big vulnerability area for, uh, I guess also the electrical grid should be mentioned, but uh, anyway, so that's why I asked. And then that's why security by design is truly important. Mm -hmm. And that, like, one example is Zigbee Protocol. I mean, you guys know about it. It's a wireless community protocol for small devices. From day one, when they started doing this development or the standardization, in 2003, by the way, they had a group called the Security uh, Work Group that was especially uh, pretty much responsible for making sure these things are secure. So that's the way it should be. In Nest, we have a CPS public working group, which means we are trying to create a framework for IoT and CPS uh, mm -hmm. going forward. We have a dedicated working group for security and privacy. And that's the way it should be. From I mean, you cannot just develop something and say later add security on top. Yeah, that would probably work a long time ago, but not anymore. And it has to be designed. And that's, it comes down to yours. The SCADA was not exactly designed to right. do it that way, but right. now things have changed and we are aware of those. It's just that, these two things have go hand by hand, hand in hand, all together in parallel without stepping onto the other's toes. That's what it is. We've got about uh, 15 minutes left. So let's... Yeah, I'm uh, Lynn Hawes from the State Department. Uh, extending a, uh, a question I asked at the plenary session, and actually the SCADA thing comes in interesting because that's the first thing I worked on in 1975 was SCADA system. <laughs> so I. Uh, I have a little bit of, but my point, my uh, question that relates to, you know, most of the development and, and applications are going to be done by folks right now that are in high school and college, and I mean, not a lot by the people that are already out there working. I mean, we are at the very beginning of this thing. My question is, I have not seen, and maybe you are aware of it, uh, much in the way of changing curriculums or adding to curriculums in the technology area. That act that bring this subject to light, and I'll even use the SCADA example. I went, I was a dub graduated a double E. I would have had no clue that that's what I would have had to consider in you know some of the SCADA work I did back in 1975. Now you know maybe it didn't didn't have to worry about it because on a separate network. But my point is, I think you know we've got to get a more formal approach to. Uh, our educational system to bring these issues into the conversation. Uh, n not just, I'm not saying you just change the, uh, the engineering programs. I think we need to change some of the uh, maybe business oriented or, or, uh, or government oriented programs as well to bring some technology aspects. These problems are converging very, very quickly in this sphere of, of uh, policy, privacy, Technology and it's just accelerating. So and it's into multiple sectors. So I'm. So I guess it's part of my question is: Do we know of any formal efforts in this area? What should or do we let it happen organically, like we've always let it happen? I think we maybe. My my inclination is maybe go a little bit more proactive on that. So. Yeah, I would. Um, so through most of 2014, I was I was involved with the um, president's National Security Telecommunications Advisory Committee to report on national security and preparedness implications of the Internet of Things. And one of the things we heard most commonly throughout was where are the, uh, where are the future? Where, who's learning to do this? That was part. And the other was that there's a bifurcated educational system. There's not, there's people who know IT security, there's people, maybe trifurcated, people know IT and there's people who know industrial and they're not connecting. So finding someone who knows SCADA systems and security, that, you know, multiple people call them the purple unicorn. There just aren't enough of them, so we need to we need an educational track that is teaching people industrial control system security. Um, there was I'm, I don't think it was it might have been UVA. There was one university we talked to. It might have been University of Richmond. It was Virginia that had begun the effort to create a curriculum on it. Now this is a year, eighteen months old. Things are moving quickly, but uh, you identify a real problem, which is people who understand 
all the different angles to this. They're just not out there. Um, I can give you one example of the, <clears throat> as you said, education, especially at the K-12 level, is extremely important in IoT. 30 years from now, it probably is not going to be me who is going to be the driving force of IoT in this world. It's going to be students, middle school, elementary school, high school students. Um, one of the things we are trying to encourage is put out a program. And not we lead the program, but as a part of this uh, Global City Teams Challenge program, there is a, a team that is connecting high school students by throwing out what we call IoT kits. Essentially, it's a small board uh, with a bunch of sensors, 25 different sensors, which can be uh, 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 permutated in any way you want. Throw those out to high schools and let them play with it and put the data and then share the data and use the data. And obviously it has to go through all the security and it's very in the secure environment. But by doing that, you see amazing things happen. I mean, you don't even imagine what high school students could do out of these things. The data coming out of the Hawaii, Maui, Hawaii high school in there is being used to create an app in, uh, in Montgomery County, a high school in the, over there. And they collaborated to create. We didn't really do anything. We provided an environment. We threw in the kits, and we threw in APIs. We threw in the cloud system. Again, that's not what I do, but one of the teams in the program I run, uh, which is a private sector team, not me, is actually doing it. And we, I think, is kind of important role. Again, government doesn't necessarily need to drive these things, but if government can provide an environment and program that these type of things can grow, uh, and I wouldn't say organic because we are helping them to grow. That, I think, could be a, a role uh, of the government, and then that's their, their programs out there like. If so government's not going to drive K-12 education policy, why do we have a government? I mean, honestly, <laughs> spoken as a former educator myself. Um, so big debate at the K-12 issue is not just... Um, whether or not kids have access to the internet and know how to use a computer, which is an issue in this country. I mean, we talk about the rest of the world as if they don't you know, have access to the internet. We have lots of public schools in this country that do not have resources to get kids online. They can't do their homework at home because they don't have access to the internet at home. So setting aside that baseline access issue, we still have a curriculum that reflects 1950s science and technology issues. And someone said to me just last night at an event in Seattle, I learned how to dissect a frog. I barely know how to turn you know, a computer on more so what happens behind the black box when it, I actually do it. We need critically thinking consumers and citizens who know enough to question the code, the code that is going to drive their world 30 years from now. So absolutely agree. And groups like Code.org and Black Girls Code and lots of other organizations that are helping create code literacy and computer literacy at the youngest ages and in the most diverse populations, absolutely a given. We've also had this debate in this country about STEM education at the, the post-secondary and higher education level, absolutely. Do we need more computer scientists and engineers? Sure. But I think that, we've act that, that actually has jumped the shark. What we need are computer scientists and engineers who have heart, who have a liberal arts education, who have humanities degrees, who can integrate the people and the device and think about the behavior and the society that it's going to create. It's not enough to say, yes, we need more computer science and engineers, sure. And we need immigration policies and other policies that support. And, and your point is absolutely right. The Europeans are looking at us going, what do we need to do in terms of our policies about investment and finance and, and innovation to create a Silicon Valley? I mean, they're looking with some envy and some you know, some sense that it's not even just advertising. There's a whole slew of, of regulatory policies that they are, they are reconsidering. Um, but we need to integrate. You know, it's no longer good enough that your engineering school's over here and your, your arts and sciences are over there. We need cross-cutting educational curriculum that's going to work. We're working with Berkeley. We're working with MIT. There's groups at Princeton and a number of other higher ed, hardcore engineering teams that are realizing they need social policy and social science as part of their core curriculum to create good, full, well-rounded thinking engineers. Yeah, I would just add to that that, uh, you know, the success of Apple was largely dependent on the fact that Steve Jobs took calligraphy, calligraphy course, excuse me, it's a tougher word to say, at, um, at Reed College. Um, actually, he just sat in on the course because he had already dropped out. So he approached, um, he approached the design of the Mac through a, a lens of design. Um, and today, the most successful apps on the App Store have the best user experience and the best design. Um, and I think that you know one dangerous thing that we're doing with regards to STEM education is we're throwing out the arts, um, music, 
Uh, also, some of the most successful apps have the best uh, music. They have the best um, audio. So I think it's just really amazing to see. I mean, I'm, I'm so I'm obviously a huge Tim supporter, and we're supporting the GoPilot um, Hackathon. It's the largest uh, high school hackathon series in the country uh, next month, and it's awesome. And I love I love all of that. But I think that we also, you know, I think as a as a group of technologists, really need to uh, think hard about how we can keep the arts in our schools. It's hugely critical. There was a great book written by a, another DC um, gentleman, Dan Pink. I don't know if you know Dan. He's a great author. He's written a number of, of really good books. One of them was uh, A Whole New Mind, Why Right Brain Thinkers Will Rule the World. And in an age of commoditization, design and um, artistic sensibilities tend to shine through, and that's what rules the day. Um, so all this talk about you know technology and the need to teach kids code, which is absolutely true, I will back that up a thousand percent, um, has to be met with uh, with arts. Can I add another element to that that um, Mila made me think of when you talk about we need more than just technologists. You know, before I got sucked down the, the cyber wormhole, I was doing general homeland type stuff, and I was teaching a course at the University of Maryland Law School, it's a small seminar. And, one of our seminars, one of our classes was on cyber, and uh, I, I expected these eager young law students tend to be not liberal in the political, but liberal thinking, you know, respect privacy. I expected them to come in and just come after me about, you know, the government's doing this, the government's doing that. So I was all prepared to say, you know, how many babies need to die before the government can read your public posting type of thing, and it, and it was the exact opposite. Um, the first year I walked in and they were all saying, oh, we don't, the government already reads everything. We don't really care about that. It's all out there. And I thought, okay, maybe that's an anomaly. And for three years, it was the same attitude. And I had to be the opposite of, wait, aren't you worried? Do you really think that this, this, this information should be accessible and, 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 and mined and, and whatnot? And what I take from that, though, is, is it was shocking to begin with, but 10, 15, 20 years, those are the people who are going to be setting policy. And if their attitude towards privacy is that meh, then I don't, it worries me about where privacy is going. That's going to bleed into technology. And, and I don't know if that's because of the ubiquity of social media or whatnot, but that certainly was the attitude. You know, it's not a scientific sample size, but three um, seminars of young law students all basically almost to a person agreed, but, you know, we don't have any privacy. We don't really care. And it was the we don't really care part that scared the crap out of me. Uh, <clears throat> Hi, I'm Jonathan Lichman from the Providence Group, and I have a, my question really gets is I want to move back to the question of ethics. Um, so uh, ethics is not always conflated with uh, laws, rules, regulations, right? But is a, a, a body of behavior that is uh, normative, and most professions. Um, regulate, self-regulate, and, and uh, adhere to and, and articulate and um, evolve their ethical uh, positions on a variety of issues. So um, psychology is a great example where uh, the ethics of how psychologists deal with mental health issues has evolved considerably in the last 10 years, let alone the last 20 years. And my question to the panel is, um, because we always seem to default to the regulators or, or new laws. And the question really is, is if software development, or hardware development, or, or any IoT-related kind of things is a professional endeavor, is there a professional model like law or science or, or other kinds of activities, engineering, business ethics, right, where uh, how we talk about ethics and what kinds of rules we say we're going to sign up to live by or develop that are outside of the government, but that are self-regulated and within uh, the group of people who are actually engaged in the uh, activity itself. Well, I think that's been a lot of what a number of the efforts that are kind of being put forth are about. It's about kind of like I, I mentioned the Motion Picture Association of America. I mean, they're seen as the body that rates mm -hmm. movies, and we feel like we can trust them. You know, I'm a parent of a three- and four-year-old, so... I definitely look for the G movies, and I feel good when I find a G movie, and I know that that's going to be appropriate for my family. That's completely industry run. And, and in the app space, I think that's what, I don't know if you're working in that area, but I know that that's what ACT, uh, Jonathan Zuck, who couldn't be here today, but um, ACT is doing a lot of work around that, and they, um, they actually acquired Moms, uh, Moms with Apps, uh, which was a group that actually picked up a lot of steam and actually became quite powerful, um, and a trusted source. Um, for finding out if an app was good or not for children. So um, 
you know, that was an early effort, the Moms with Apps, and they, they actually became a really, really trusted source for that. So that was a kind of an individual group of people that got together and built up a consortium and became a trusted source. They then got acquired by an association that's been around for 15 or 20 years in town here. Um, and I, you know, I, I'm not sure what the App Developers Alliance is doing on this case, but um, I think that there are there are efforts, and it's good to see. Um, but I think there, you know, that that's going to continue to need to evolve. And you know, you think it's it's DC, so we have a number of associations. They all have their members. They all sort of compete. But um, there does need to be some consensus on this, um, you know, as as things evolve. If I can add one more thing, <clears throat> so the, if you look at the industry standards and self-regulation uh, landscape. Mm -hmm. About five years ago, previous before five years, it was all about IEEE, ISO, some kind of like uh, regular, uh, it's not really standard, SDO, that's what you call it. About five years ago, the dynamics started shifting, started shifting from those SDOs to more of a consortium model. Meaning that industry players, they actually get together with a certain goal and then they create either their framework, or it's not exactly regulation per se, it's a framework, it's a guideline, but there are like a number of them. IIC is one of them, and OIC is another threat group, for example, all join alliance, all these things are, so it's a good sign that, I, I believe it's a good sign, because the industry now finally uh, realizing that you know, having written document about standards is not going to really solve the problem. They really have to put it on the field and market. So I think self-regulation is, is actually very uh, good and uh, that's necessary model. Uh, and I, I think industry is going to that direction right now. I see a business model for an, a good housekeeping seal of approval for the devices inside your house where you could trust what they're doing and how, what their practices are. That's a good, we should go into business there, Dan. Yeah, there, there, go. And, and there is some, some work that's being um, done along those lines in terms of self-regulatory guidelines related to UL kind of certifications or best practices uh, for the internet of things. We're almost out of time, but please, one, one last question. Okay, Jakobun, CSIS. If I can actually ask two quick related questions. With the 50 billion devices that Cisco estimates will be connected by 2020, IoT devices, do you see a new set of vulnerabilities emerging that are in any way radical, radically different from the types of vulnerabilities that we see currently in cyberspace? And looking at the 11 billion of IoT devices that we have as of today, including all the tablets and smartphones, do you, what actual hacks that had a notable effect involving major service disruptions, casualties, and possibly deaths? Do you do you make out? Have we seen any of these? major threats that everyone talks about, or is that, as of now, just um, a major concern that is out there, but might not really prove to realize with all the talk that's out there about security? Is that actually something that has been put to challenge? Thank you. I, I think right now the biggest casualty of, uh, of cyber attacks are uh, our leaders, uh, CEOs, uh, CEO of Target had to step down after the cyber attack, and then the you know the head of the OP OPM. Um, yep. Uh, last week, um, yep. and it's kind of interesting, right? So that's um, <clears throat> you know when we see that type of thing happening, that's getting everybody's attention in the market. So at the C level suddenly this is becoming very, very important because it's their job, their livelihood, um, uh, you know, are, are being threatened by this. So that's actually gonna start changing behavior all the way down. Um, so that's, that's kind of like first thing that came to mind was like, you know, the heads are rolling, uh, you know, as these things happen. And you asked the question like, will we see different attacks? Absolutely, I mean, and I think the attacks are data, you know, it's, it's the data, the data. Um, you know that that I think is the is the you know is is what people are after, um, and uh, and then you know, what happens with that data. Well, thank you very much for your attention. We've come to the the end of our panel, so please join me join me in thanking our panelists.